Hey guys, what's going on? Um, welcome back to a video. This one's a bit different. I'm doing something. I'm actually recording a podcast episode and I'm visually recording it. So um, I actually have a guest because I wanted to do this one. This is one of the things I'm starting off with. Uh, and this is my friend, Laura. I don't know if it's Zidane or Zidane. Or there's, there's a, you have a crazy last name or something. So I've got it down as Zidane. That's <laughs> but she's fine. From is that what is it? It's, did I say it it's right? Sta- it's Stanavage, but I just say Stan because it's so much easier. Ah, oh, Stan. Okay, I get it. Okay, so but her podcast is not neurotypical podcast, and you can get them on Instagram. I'll leave all the links below anyway, so you guys can see exactly uh, what is going on uh, with her Instagram and stuff. I think your Instagram is pretty dope. That's how I found you, actually. I think we we cross paths on Instagram. Yes, is that yeah. How we got it. So yeah, that was really fun. And um, you, do you want to, yeah, you can tell me a little bit about your podcast and tell my audience what's going on. Sure. So my podcast was really a way to kind of process and deal with my late diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. Um, basically, I, my son was diagnosed around eight with um, autism spectrum disorder. And as I kind of learned about the whole autism world and what autism actually looks like, which I was shocked that I really wasn't aware of the presentations, um, you know, in a a majority of people, um, I started to kind of be like, wait, that sounds like me, or that sounds like me as a kid, Mm -hmm. or, you know, just all these light bulbs started going off. And um, about a week after my son was diagnosed, I took an autism spectrum quotient test and I scored a 40 out of 50 which is a diagnostic tool yeah (laughs) diagnostic tool used um commonly here in the U.S. um through psychologists and psychiatrists and stuff and I was like wow I think I have autism like I had it was shocking because I really didn't know much about it and it was processing it and I decided to kind of go online and look all around and um, see if other people were going through the same thing as me. And I, I found a lot of information, but not really the information I was looking for. So I was like, you know what? I, di- I didn't find too many podcasts. I found I found your podcast, which was really um, educational, and your YouTube, which, which I really appreciated, and appreciate. um, a couple others. But I also didn't hear too much, too many women, I would say, going through similar things on podcasts and YouTube and thing like that, things like that. So I was like, you know what, I'm just going to start recording what I'm going through. And that's how my podcast started. Um, and it's called Not Neurotypical Podcast. And it really is just my journey. And, and a lot of it happened real time. So it was like real time processing of every step of the way through thinking I have possibly have autism to getting the evaluation to actually getting diagnosed and then processing the diagnosis. So that's kind of the whole thing. The yeah. Whole thing. yeah and it's, it's still kind of going. I'm still processing because this was only four months ago. Sure. And that's yeah. super, super raw, super new. Yes. But I, do you know, I love it because like, even though I know you said then you said, oh, it's just my story and my kind of journey, but it, like it, everything adds value. So like you are definitely going to add value because your experiences are unique and your experiences may be able to kind of resonate with somebody else. And if they find that resonation, they'll be like, oh yeah. And I think that's, that's great. And I love that people sharing their personal stories because it means so much to other people. It's awesome. Yes. Yes. I- so I was going to say, I've gotten a lot of of feedback um, from my followers, especially on Instagram and people who listen to the podcast. And it's been really positive, which has meant so much to me because you're kind of putting yourself out there. You have no idea how people are going to accept the information. And and the the autism world is is a little scary to dive into. (laughs) Um, There's there's a (laughs) lot of strong um, feelings and and emotions. And of course, it's it's a very... um, it can be polarizing. Um, so it was scary, it can be. but it, it helped me to process it through discussing it with just putting myself out there and opening the invite for others to kind of share with me as well. And it helped a lot. Definitely. I think like one of the things you, you touched on there about the autism community on a whole is kind of like, especially autistic adults, and um, they're so, they, they can be quite opinionated and those opinions or strong opinions can be quite destructive sometimes. And I feel like that does turn a lot of people away. And one thing I kind of deal with that is I say like there's, you know, we're all doing the same thing and some people have certain views on some things and just leave them to it, you know, no matter how destructive or negative it may seem, just let them do it. You know, they're just obviously going through something and they're learning something themselves. So it's kind of like, never get like scared about the community and they'd be watching this who thinks like, oh, I've come across this before, just don't worry about it. You know, keep going, doing what you're doing. You're doing great. Nobody's doing anything wrong basically we're just doing our best and that's all we can ask for really so 
Um, today's episode is uh, we're talking about late autism diagnosis, and I want to talk specifically about why not adult autism diagnosis is very important, and why late diagnosis is important. Because I was diagnosed 26 years old with um, Asperger syndrome and ADHD, because it was when they were still diagnosing it as Asperger's, and not just like ASD. Um, and before that, I actually had loads of diagnosis, you know, growing up with like dyslexia and like you know maybe OCD and things, and they officially diagnosed me when I was 26 with Asperger's syndrome and ADHD and OCD. And that was kind of like a bombshell. That was kind of like, whoa, right. like I didn't know anything about it at the, at the time in 2013. I was like, uh, you know, I, my life was going one way and then I get this diagnosis and it's like, oh, like oh, that's what it is. And so it was a very difficult and interesting time. But I realize now, like to me personally, I would say that an adult diagnosis is important because what it did is it accessed support and help and that access and support help actually helped ease up the issues in my life that were like uh, horrendously devastating you know and i would want to ask you a question like so how do you feel about like why would you say adult diagnosis is important for autism well i i think it's so important because self-advocating for i mean no matter what you have or are going through it's so important to know how to self-advocate and and get the support you need whether that is Um, through your city or through your spouse or through your mom and dad or wherever you need support and without really in my opinion knowing what you are dealing with internally or whatever struggle you're having it's so hard to advocate for yourself and figure out what type of support you actually need so for me the diagnosis was, was all about bringing that to light and figuring out okay where am I where do I need to grow what support do I need and my picture of what I needed after my diagnosis changed a lot. Um, So there's been a lot of growth since then, but I wouldn't have had that if I didn't really know what I was dealing with. 100%. Hundred yeah. percent. It's kind of like when you're in the dark and you're kind of figuring out, like, where do I go from here? What am I trying to do? But when somebody says, "Oh no, it's this," and there's already these outlines and templates of ways to help, then you have somewhat of a grounding. To say, "Oh, okay, right. it makes more sense." Exactly. And I think, and that's kind of comforting as well. And it's kind of like it's a relief because it's that stress of like, because I grew up thinking like, "Oh my God, what is wrong with me?" Like, you know, I couldn't. I just felt like. I just felt completely odd, you know, I felt kind of outside of the circle of my friends, I felt like completely isolated and I did, they didn't like the things I like and they didn't understand how I was behaving and it was kind of like one of those things where I thought, oh my goodness, that there must be something just devastatingly wrong with me, but there's nothing wrong, it's just that it happens to be a condition and I think yes. that diagnosis kind of helps you go, oh yeah, it's just, I'm, I'm not like broken, right. I'm just a bit different. It all clicks and I was diagnosed with ADHD yeah. as a kid, so I was very familiar with um, you know, neurodiversity in general and kind of, um, yeah. I had accepted that obviously, cause I had a long time to process that. Um, and I, and 100%. I am still diagnosed with ADHD, but for years it was kind of like in my, in the back of my head, like, is there more going on? Like ADHD doesn't fit completely. Um, and I yeah, brought that yeah. up a lot to doctors, therapists over the years. And they were always like, oh, you probably just, you know, anxiety can be caused from ADHD and all that. And it wasn't until my son was diagnosed that any doctor took me seriously. So it was kind of an important part of my journey that my son was diagnosed. Yeah, definitely. I, you know, I hear that so Mm -hmm. much. Like so many of my viewers say like, Hey, I was watching your stuff to get information on my kid. And then I realized, uh, this makes sense (laughs) to me. And then when they went through the diagnosis of their kid, then the the doctors or whoever was assessing was like, Hey, you know, and and it it goes to show actually, because I, well, that's one of the things I did a video on like, you know, what causes autism and there's no like direct cause, but one of the things that like people say is the main kind of factor in, in deciding if your neurons are going to fashion the way they do, uh, is genetics, you know, Mm -hmm. it's all down to genetics. Mm -hmm. So if you carry a, the genome pool that may be carrying a neurodiverse strain, then, then that's how it's carried too. So it isn't uncommon that your parent and your kid would be on the spectrum because, of course, you know, it's your offspring at the end of the day. Yeah, definitely. And it, that's just super interesting. Now, uh, you said our ADHD is quite interesting. Like I have ADHD as well, and I was diagnosed with ADHD and Asperger's at the same time. And it's fascinating that a lot of women on the spectrum will get diagnosed with ADD or ADHD mm-hmm. when it actually is autism and another one is bipolar yes. disorder and when it should be autism. So did you find that kind of, did they, did they say to you, oh, it's not ADHD, it's actually autism or did they say, no, you have both? They they said that they would continue the diagnosis of, of ADHD and I agree. I, I do f- definitely align with, um, you know, specific executive functioning issues of ADHD. Mm-hmm. The problem is that it overlaps so much. <laughs> 
between autism like i don't on it like sometimes people ask me <laughs> like video. they ask me like where yeah totally like where does that kind of where does adhd end and <laughs> autism begin i'm like i have no idea absolutely no idea but yeah, it, um yeah they definitely just continued my adhd diagnosis and then added the autism spectrum disorder diagnosis so here's a question do you feel like do you feel that being diagnosed as an adult is more beneficial than being diagnosed as a kid or do you think it's more beneficial to be diagnosed as a kid <sighs> That's a loaded question for different reasons. So as a kid, um, I needed a lot of support that I didn't get. Um, and I think definitely early intervention would have been good for me and with as far as school is concerned. But as an adult, I actually am really, really happy that I found out later, like after I had my three mm-hmm. children, I, I think I might have been more hesitant to have children, which is crazy, but I probably would have mm-hmm. if I was diagnosed as a kid and kind of grew up. And um, now with my three kids who are also on the spectrum, um, I... Well, all three of them. So my two of them are diagnosed. And then I have I have one that's getting an evaluation that's a little more gray area. I'm not totally sure, but I think it's a definite sure. possibility. Um, yeah. But yeah, so but as far as I'm concerned, pretty much three on the spectrum at this point. And yeah. um, so if I had an early childhood diagnosis of that, that might have not played out similar. So it's sure. like pros and cons yeah. to both. I'm, I'm, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I. Yeah. And I totally agree with you with the whole kind of like the parenting thing. It does kind of like, so I was diagnosed before having children. So like the whole conversation, I had that conversation, you know, is it, is there a possible, like to me, that's thinking like, what if my kid's on the spectrum? Not like it made any difference, but those things do go through your mind and you think like, well, is that a deciding factor? Maybe it is for some people, you know, that that is another thing that could come into an adult's life. And also guys, I just want to jump in and say that if anybody wants to join in this conversation, uh, leave a comment down below. I'm sure Laura will jump on as well uh, when this video goes up and, and, and reply to the comments. And if you're listening over on the podcast, if you can send us, uh, some messages on Instagram or Twitter. So it's at the Aspie world. And also Laura's handle is just Laura Z D A N. Uh, you can get her on Instagram and you can shoot us some questions over there to carry on this conversation. If you want to jump in, that is, um, also anybody who's watching this far and you haven't already subscribed to the podcast and the uh, video, make sure to subscribe right now and make sure you got notifications turned on as well. Uh, and those people listening on the podcast, I know who you are. I know you're listening and you haven't subscribed yet. So do it. Okay. So, um, moving forward, uh, ADHD was quite an interesting one. I mean, ADHD is a fascinating one. And I think that um, more people are diagnosed younger with ADHD than they are autism. And then they wait kind of like, and then autism is more popular to be diagnosed later on in life, especially now with this millennial generation. And a friend of mine runs a channel called How to ADHD, uh, where she talks about like, you know, growing up with ADHD and stuff like that. And when we were in um, uh, LA, not this year, the year before. So we did a video two years ago at VidCon, um, the first video that we did together. And we were talking about the fact that you know, she, she feels like she has, um, you know, comparable traits in autism, uh, but has an ADHD diagnosis. And she's like, where's that line? You know, where is that line? And how, how do you know? And, and, and it's very, it, it fascinates me because like you said, where does one end and the other kind of like start and the, it's kind of fluid, but it's, it's like this. It's how I see it. It's fluid when, if you just have ADHD, you can see just ADHD, but if you just have autism, you, you can just see the, the autism. But when you have both, they, they're so fluidly interlocked. Yeah. It's, it's so difficult to pick out which part is doing what. And I, and I tried to explain this in the video and it, and it didn't work, but I, I, what would you say that the main kind of differences that you know between ADHD and autism or the main clashes, how they clash? Right. Um, I think that even though social communication issues can kind of be a factor with ADHD, um, I think with ADHD, to me, my interpretation is that it's just a little more of like social awkwardness sometimes, like not mm-hmm. necessarily in, mm-hmm. in everyone with ADHD. And with with autism spectrum disorder, I think it goes a little further with, you know, not necessarily processing situations as they are happening and um, a little more, you know, like one. The biggest thing I learned through my autism diagnosis is that communication goes both ways. So I, I was always like, I'm a great communicator. And I was like, I can definitely like express myself and I am expressive, um, which sometimes that's like a myth of autism that <laughs> you're not expressive or things like that. And I am. But what I realized is that I, you know, communication is a two way street. So I wasn't always yeah, receiving yeah. the information correctly. 
And I, I think yeah. when that goes a little further than just social awkwardness, that's more autism spectrum disorder than necessarily ADHD. Like that's a major difference that I found. And then everything else to me is, is gray area <laughs> with the two. It's, it's tough. <laughs> I do, I do agree, and I and I feel like there's there's so much gray area, um, and I tried. I think I've done like four video attempts <laughs> on my channel trying to explain this, and then every time I'd record the video and I promote, I'm thinking, Dan, I just I just sound like I'm I'm just confusing the matter yeah. further because I'm I'm not making any clear definitions. Okay, so here's a question, and what would you see? Because so one of the things I'm fascinated is that like there's more. I think it's like four times as many males are diagnosed with autism than females, mm-hmm. which is obviously bizarre when we live in a predominantly female uh, society where there are 50, like 1% of the, the population are female or 52% of the population are female and the rest are male. So my question is this, like, what would you like to see more of from female advocates? So like yourself and other people, right. like, what, what do you think, what are the striving goals for female advocates of autism? Well, I, I think that there are, this is totally anecdotal. I'm not sure about this, but it seems sure. like there's more female advocates that are totally fine with just self-diagnosing. And mm. I I don't want to judge them and say that they, they have a duty to get diagnosed, but I really feel like the more women who are diagnosed officially on the books is going to help the next generation of girls coming up and help them understand what it looks like more in women because it is very, it, it seems to present very different Um, and like you said, like women are typically diagnosed a little later, you know, and that's majorly because the, the presentation is, is so different. Um, even my, my four year old daughter is who I think very possibly on the spectrum. She, I'm not sure even meets the, the qualifying criteria quite yet, but I think she will like once she kind of goes to school and grows in that way. Um, so it's, it's like one of those things, the more people on the books, especially women, the more they will know and, and be able to diagnose earlier for younger sure. girls. And that's a great answer, actually. And it kind of moves into the next question. Like, I had a question, and I was going to ask you, what would you say to someone who's undiagnosed and on the fence, or uh, especially a female who's undiagnosed? And again, yeah. you just kind of answered that. Just do it. And I think I think you're absolutely right. When uh, And then there's two things here as well. Oh, there's a few things. Like if you're undiagnosed and you're self-diagnosing, one is that you could be self-diagnosing with something that isn't the condition. So you could say that I'm autistic, but you're not. And it could be something else where you need help in a specific area yeah. and you're actually looking in the wrong areas for help, right? right? And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that you need to be aligned with the right thing. That's why I think official diagnosis is, um, you know, directly proportional to success. Right. And in terms of... Um, that you said about like the more yeah the more the more official diagnosis you have as, uh, for women the 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 better the fight goes to turn the the whole kind of idea that oh it's just males because a lot of people still think it's just males I don't even know how this comes about that you right. know, oh, females don't have autism I know. it's like I know it's still a common misconception about? um and and like you said I think it's it still is four times more males than women diagnosed. Yeah. So yeah, and it's 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 so bizarre, and it's not. But that's not. It's weird because they say they say it's f- because the statistics say this: four times as many males have autism than females, which is wrong. It's four, many, four times as many males are diagnosed right. with autism. We don't know the actual amount right. of females who are sitting there undiagnosed. And I'd say that it's probably higher because we'll just look at, like I said, percentage wise, there's more females than males in the world. So obviously there's going to be more females with autism. I mean, it doesn't make much sense. How yeah, I agree. They, it just that I think that annoys me. I know that there's. Bodies like the National Autistic Society right now are doing like training for, you know, education for females on the spectrum. So for professionals working in the field to kind of spot it. And I know that now the government have made it mandatory for all public institutions to take autism training starting in 2020. So I think we're slowly getting there in the UK, at least. Um, and so this is what my, my, my next question to you would be like, who would you say the, the big kind of like charity organizations or the big organizations to, that help autism, anything that people can take away? So say someone's watching, most of my audience are in America. Hey guys, how's it going? Um, and most of them are in, in the USA and guys listening on the podcast. Where would they go to get information about autism? Where would you say the best place from your perspective? And this is completely unbiased. You can say anything you want because look, we're non-judgmental. Yeah, I, I really like Asan, A-S-A-N. They're um, the... Aut- autism. I'm sorry. They're. I forget the name of it, but um, it's A S A N. They're a really great organization, um, and it's really all about self advocacy. So they're kind of like giving you information. They have a lot of like toolkits on their website for different scenarios that you oh. might be going through. Um, they dope. give information for a range of supports needed. Um, so there there are options for people all over the spectrum, um, and they are. 
also very focused on adults. Um, so okay. so it's it's a great if you if you think you might be late diagnosed, really great. Um, I'm not sure the website offhand, but if you, I don't know if you could pull that out. Sure, I'm gonna. Yeah, they're they're really yeah, really I'm just great. Do it right now. Um, and I, I believe that there are quite a few different countries have you know their network in in their different countries specifically. So sure. it's it's a good. So this one, so the yeah, the ASAN is the the Autistic Self Advocacy yes, Network. That's it. Is that the yes, one you're talking yes. about? Okay, so so basically, so anyone listening on the podcast, it's autisticadvocacy.org. Um, I will actually leave this link down in the description of the video as well, and watching on the video um, because obviously uh, Laura's recommending this, and I think it's a great site. I've come across these guys before. I do follow them on Twitter, I think mm -hmm. it is, and uh, they are great. But all the links for this is in, in the description below, and also links to uh, Laura's Instagram as well. You can check out her podcast and listen in there because it's super dope. Um, so that kind of I just want to tie it up here right now and say, is there anything that you'd like to say to this audience before we kind of like, you know, yeah, I, I wanted, wrap it I up. wanted to go back to the, you know, women in kind of feeling like, should I get diagnosed? Um, one, one thing I really tell women is that if you are worried that doctors or therapists aren't going to believe you, um, that's totally okay to feel. I mean, I felt that too. I was a wreck going into my evaluation and I put all that in my podcast mm. and, and I get that. <laughs> like I was fully convinced I had it, but I personally really needed that medical confirmation for one. If my son was diagnosed, I really wanted to like know that I had it with him kind of thing. Like let's get diagnosed together sure. kind Makes of feeling. Yeah. Um, but I tell women that it's okay to take your time and do a lot of research and kind of become your own advocate and expert um, on, you know, how this might be affecting you. Um, but the goal personally, I feel should be definitely to get diagnosed and get that confirmation, get on the books, but you don't have to do it right away. You can take your time and figure it out and kind of make sure that you are in agreement with it and, and kind of go from there. And then also you can kind of um, have some time, as they say, to take the mask off. Um, I know a lot of women yeah, mask yeah. and if they go into an evaluation masking, it's going to be very issue. hard yeah. to get diagnosed. So I say take yeah, the definitely. time, get to know your autistic traits that you have that you believe might be autistic so you can properly communicate that and i brought like 20 written pages yep. of notes to my doctor <laughs> I to my evaluation <laughs> um and my the doctor actually loved it he thanked me for it he he thought that was great um so it's okay to take your time and prepare and be ready for it yeah. don't just wing it because chances are you might not get a diagnosis it's and that's going to be so frustrating so um, yeah, of course, especially when you're desperate yes, for like the help and the support exactly, and the access. You, yeah, exactly. So that's kind it's of so, my so my final thoughts with, with late diagnosis. Awesome. Okay, well, Laura, look, thank you so much. And I know it's super early for you, so I really appreciate you coming on the show because we're in different countries, <laughs> different time zones. And uh, it's been amazing. So if you guys uh, would like to check out Laura's stuff, please check out her Instagram. And the links are down below, actually. You can check out all her stuff. And also, guys, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up because I want to know if you like this kind of video. We're going to do more of these, hopefully, if you like it. And uh, yeah, I'll see you next time, guys. Peace.